I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, just minister for just for a little bit here. I, I, I'm just in the mood to kick over some more sacred cows today. <laughs> Doing some cow tipping. You know where that came from? You know where that came from? That illustration comes out of the, with some of you will remember, that there's a story about the Israelites when Moses went to the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, to get the Word of God. And he was gone a long time. And the people started grumbling. They said, wait a minute. He's been gone a long time. He might have died up there, and he'll never be coming back. And things are a mess down here. We don't know which way is up. We need something to worship. So make us a golden calf, which was actually an Egyptian god, a calf. So he finally succumbed. Of course, he, he copped out when Moses asked him about it later. He said, well, the people made me do it. <laughs> yeah, the people made me do it, right. Do you know how long it would take to make a golden calf out of jewelry? It would take a long time. That would be, have to be a purposeful decision on a daily basis for many, many days and weeks. The people made me do it, give me a break. He succumbed to it as well. So, that's, so see, what they needed was, they didn't know which way, way was up. So they needed something sacred. So they developed, just like what we've got today, what we've done today, we have our sacred cows, because we're not hearing from God for ourselves. Although he's wanting to speak to us, we're not hearing from him ourselves in our own hearts. And so we erect sacred cows. Last week's sacred cow was, God will never give you anything you can't handle. Well, he never said that, ever, anywhere. Okay, and so what is, well, the title of, the title of this teaching for today is, does your belief in God, is it best reflected by Jesus or by ISIS? So that seems to be relevant today. I mean, at first I was going to call it a, a more glorious God. And I thought, well, that sounds a little too theological. People really don't understand the word glory anyway and really what that means. A more glorious God, okay. Then I thought, well, you know what? I th there's a few more cows to tip over. So, you know, maybe we'll, we'll just go that direction. And then I got to thinking, you know, this is a perfect time because... <laughs> The first thing that we will automatically react to in horror is, well, Jesus is most best reflects my belief in God. Is it? Does it? Jesus was redemption and restoration. Isis is control and judgment. What best reflects God to you since Jesus said he, I don't mean your imagination of what Jesus was probably like that fits what you want him to be. I mean what he looked like in the scriptures and what he acted like in the scriptures that you get from meditating and studying and reading and becoming familiar with the scriptures. See, sacred cows are erected in your life that have no real power except to deceive you away from the real power of God if you are a couch potato on the Word. What is that? It means you sit around and, and let everybody tell you what the Word says instead of you finding out for yourself and taking it seriously for yourself and investing time in it for yourself. And don't run it through the filter of what religion has always told you it means. Because any understanding you have of what the Scripture says, I don't care what your doctrinal positions and favorite Scripture verses are, you don't have a full understanding of what they mean. Just like you don't know everything about, there is to know about God. Because if you did, then you've really reduced Him. So, religion has given us a very judgmental, controlling picture of God and what they've done is they pulled a lot of references out of the Old Testament to do it. 
that gives you the idea that God is judgmental and controlling. But they've also erected some other statements that the scriptures never say and do not support. And that is, want to hear what they are? God is in control. The fact of the matter is, if you're talking about the laws of the universe and intangibles and physical laws of the universe, yes. Because the scriptures say everything is held together by the word of his power. And what it is referring to is all of the, physic, the physics and everything that has to do with the physical universe. But, and the reason this is so important is because your belief on this changes love. If God is in control of human beings, then love dies and is no longer love, but is evil. Love that controls isn't love, it's evil. Now, God took a big risk in this. But the only possible way to give us free will and freedom of choice and therefore a full expression of love is to allow man to do whatever he would do and not stop him. Now, you can move in and guide. Okay, let me give you some other things that go right along with that. And it's this one. You've probably said it yourself. You've believed it. Everything happens for a reason. Now, you know what Jamie was talking about there? God has called us to comfort, lift, to help lift the burden, not add to the burden by stupid statements that don't help that cause them to question even more. Everything happens for a reason is true and a lie both. It has to be properly applied. It is true if destruction and sin happens because the reason is man chose to do it. But it is not true if God did it for some mysterious reason. And that leads us to the next one. God moves in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. Oh, I know it looks like hate, but it's really love in disguise. I know it contains pain and destruction, but it's tough love. Most stuff that we call tough love is actually human frustration. Mm, so much of the time when a parent is exercising what they're excusing as tough love, is they're actually exercising their human frustration and anger. And a lack of belief that love has enough power to do anything about the circumstance if you minister it. It's very, very hard to believe that a gentle answer turns away wrath. But the Word says it. The Word says a gentle, ha a, a gentle answer has enough power power in it to turn away wrath. But see, we live in a society where everything is solved by wrath. And who's got the biggest bang? Who's got the biggest weapons? Well, the person that exercises God's kind of love has the biggest weapon. When the disciples said, should we call down fire from heaven? Jesus said, you don't know what spirit's driving you. Now, don't, don't eisegete there. Don't put in there what you, say, you think I'm saying about politics or anything else. 
okay? Because it's just, you know, when we get into all these discussions, they're really too complicated to be given simple answers to. So, here are... Four things that I believe that we must be solid on. God is always love. And I told my wife I wasn't going to say this, but I am going to say this because it makes a point with some of y'all. God is always love, or we're all screwed. God does good all the time. If not, we're all screwed. Evil exists, and that's a reality. But God never initiates evil. If that's not true, we're all screwed. God is not in control of human behavior or else we're all screwed because we have no chance of ever knowing what love is and exercising the power of love because love has to be invited and received or it's not love. It has to be given with a voluntary attitude and not a controlling attitude. Once it becomes control, it's then become manipulation. And that's not love. That's the precursor of evil. Now, Romans 11:33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Well, that's true. But that does not equal God moves in mysterious ways his wonders to perform the way we usually apply it. Because the mysteries that's primary for us is the mystery of the love of Christ. There's going to be some situations on the surface in, in the future that you're going to see and witness and you're going to be, you're going to go, wow, you took that and did that and brought glory to yourself? You took that mountain of a mess and made a monument to your grace? How did you do that? You're mysterious. Your ways are past finding out. See, it's his, the power of his good ways, the power of his love, and its ability is past finding out. Not, that's not an excuse that we hide behind that God, his ways of getting to you, even if he's got to hurt you sometimes, yeah. well, he, he doesn't have to depend on hurting you. Now, you know, bad things happen to good people, but God, because God made bad things happen to good people, the Bible doesn't, the Bible does, absolutely does not support that. Bad things happen to good people because they make choices. But you know, his ways are mysterious. If he can just find some partners in the earth, if he can just find some partners in the earth. Desmond Tutu, I quoted him earlier. He said, you know, ever since man showed up, God's done nothing without a partner. Ever since man showed up, God does nothing without one who partners with him to work through in this earth. He doesn't just control. All right, so God's always love. God does not uh, does good all the time. Evil exists. But God never initiates it. God is not in control. Because love controlled becomes evil incarnate.
Paul's grace. And we've referred to this last week, and we've referred to this sometimes. Do you know, it says about Paul that he had great revelations, and he said, a, a minister, you know, a thorn came to me as a minister of Satan, and I asked God to deal with it. And people uh, assume that that scripture said, God sent a thorn to me. It doesn't say that. The most reputable translations and understandings of that is not Paul had an eye disease or an issue of health, but that always a thorn, many, many, many times in the scriptures, the thorn referred to an enemy nation or people that, you know, came against Paul. You had such great revelation. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? And then he went around and started teaching about, Dee Dee's a heretic. She's a heretic. And starts turning people and making her, them wonder if she's a heretic because of what she says she saw. That's a thorn. That is a thorn. And that's primarily the thorn that he was dealing with. But you know what? Paul, at the first flush of it, asked God to control the situation, and God said no. He begged him three times to make it stop, and he said no. Why? Because it was people. But he said, but my grace will do the trick. I don't have to make them stop. My grace will do the trick for you. My grace will take care of you. And it'll be like it wasn't an enemy after all. If you rely on my grace. And you know the rest of the passage says that's exactly what happened. When that finally dawned on Paul, when Paul himself got a revelation of that, he said, oh man, this is such good stuff. I glory in the fact that I'm weak. Because, man, that gives me the opportunity to suck in all the grace I can get. And that does the trick. So God doesn't need to make negative, thing, negative people stop doing what they're doing in your lives. Because he's not going to anyway by exercising control over them like ISIS would. He's not going to judge them and bring destruction in their lives to teach them a lesson like Isis would. He's going to offer his free gift of grace that is more powerful than you can ever imagine. It is so mysterious in its ability to save the day for everybody involved. I'm going to say something here. It is going to be distasteful to prob probably most of you for the moment, but I believe, I believe you have to judge this for yourself. I believe God whispered this in my ear right now as I'm talking. There are people that are currently a part of ISIS that are going to be in heaven. Amen. Because God's fabulous grace is going to redeem them. And their hearts are going to turn. And they're going to fall on their knees. And they're going to worship the one true God. Aren't you glad that God doesn't judge you for your past? No, I... I did not say that God is going to overlook the destructive evil of ISIS. If you heard me say that, then you got a carrot in your ear. Get the carrot out of your ear. That's not what I said. I said that there are people that are currently a part of ISIS who will one day be with God forever because probably because of people who care begin to intercede for them rather than just play, you know, 
you can condemn the system, but there's human beings in that system that are currently deceived that need somebody that will not approve what they're doing, but will approve of their eternal soul. And they will pray that God's light would open up the eyes of their hearts so that they would turn from their wickedness. So he told Paul, no, I'm not controlling nothing. I love you, but I'm not stopping them. But here's some grace. That'll do the trick. That'll take care of you. That'll make it okay. And he discovered, oh boy, bring it on. Beat me, beat me. Just don't touch my face. <laughs> well, I, I think I'll probably edit that out. <laughs> All right, let me finish up with this. Where are these two things? And I'll do them both really, fairly quickly. So listen really quickly. All right. I want to talk about the Lord's Prayer for a second. D- Gary's been doing a great job yep. on teaching the Lord's Prayer, and, and, it's, you know, and it continues again t- this afternoon on the area of forgiveness, right? You know, Desmond Tutu said something else. I don't keep quoting Desmond Tutu, but he said he's got a whole book out that says if we don't find forgiveness, there is no hope for humanity. <laughs> but at any rate, okay. But there's some very, very, very practical things I'm looking forward to learning myself tonight. Very practical things, some fresh revelation. You got to bring some fresh revelation, Gary? Of course he is. But the first two, we talked about our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As we understand the Lord's Prayer, our understandings are often accurate but incomplete because thy kingdom come does not mean get them and thy will be done doesn't mean let your sovereign control bring this thing into order whether they want it or not that those two phrases are actually Statements of humility and worship and submission. They are the ones that are praying those, that prayer are saying, Lord, your kingdom is not manifesting in this situation and in even my life. And I'm just saying to you, sir, your kingdom come. I submit to you. Your king, our Father who art in heaven. In other words, he's saying our. It's a plural statement, not my. We're very much individualists. It's a plural statement. And he's saying our Father, the one who gave us life that is in eternity and beyond, from eternity and beyond, the kingdom, the government that comes from there, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name is the same thing in a kingdom society where they would go before the king and say, long live the king. Hallowed be thy name is, for them, was the same thing as saying, going into his presence and going, my king, long, you know, may you live forever. It was a, it's a statement of respect for him as he, they walked into his presence. And then the very next thing they did was they recognized, I'm submitting to your kingdom. I now submit in the areas where I am not experiencing peace, joy, love, power. That's not on you, that's on me, Merle. That's not on God, that's on me. And your will be done That sounds like a power word, Chris. That sounds like a power word. Your will, your will be done. The word that we translate will more often than not in the New Testament scriptures is best translated 
desire. Our Father, who art in heaven, I submit to the life of your kingdom on a personal level before I dare to de make any declarations about the environment I'm in. I start the whole thing by my own personal submission. And I'm saying, your desire be done. May your desires be done in this place. Not my desires, your desires. Your authority come. Your authority come in my life. Your authority come in my week workplace. And what the desire of your heart is, Lord, I pray that it may manifest, that your desires will be manifest in my home, Lord. Because you see, the Scripture says that he is not willing that anyone should perish. But a whole lot of people are perishing, aren't they? But the thing about it is, is that he's not willing, but he can't control that, and he won't, or it's not love. What he's saying is there, he is not desirous that anybody should perish. It's not the desire of his heart. So therefore, that means that then we enter the picture as intercessors. And what do intercessors do? What is the ministry of intercession? It has a spiritual and a natural component, and the two must go together with everybody that exercises them. It is a, the, the physical component of intercession is to help with physical needs that an individual has. You intersect their path. It's a mercy ministry. It's mercy on a natural level, and it's mercy on a spiritual level. Here's the thing. If, in fact, we only exercise physical mercy and we don't then invest ourselves in the mercy of intercession for that individual, we are simply being codependent on them and we are just causing them to keep on abusing everything. But what our intercession does, this is the reason it's mercy, and this ties into what we said earlier. Many things that happen that people do and say and think that are contrary to the kingdom of God and the love of God are done because they're not in their right mind any more than the prodigal son was. And they need to come to their right mind. And so therefore, an intercessor's prayer prays, it, and it sounds like you're lying. It declares the truth on behalf of that person because they can't declare it for themselves. That's why there are individuals who I will pray over the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is setting me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. And I am praying that as an intercessor so that that life, they begin to come to their right mind as the light of that begins dawning inside of them. And then they make the choice to respond to God. So therefore we need, God needs, He has so much mercy he needs people who are demonstrating mercy through intercession that don't deserve it. But they don't deserve it because they really don't even at that moment have the capacity to see the truth. They've become so blinded by their own actions and their own habits. But if you only help them physically for the moment, it's only for the moment because nothing will change in their inner man. And they will not see what will bring them life ultimately. That's still your responsibility. Because if they can't see, who's going to see for them? That's why I believe that he says he, you know, Desmond Tutu said, he, you know, he, he, he's not doing anything because he's looking for partners. He's looking for partners. He can't find partners. 
He can't find faith partners. He needs faith partners. He needs somebody to step up in your home and act like God is reflected more by Jesus than he is by ISIS in attitude. God is a redeemer and a restorer. He is not a controller and a judger to destruction. We want stuff to stop. So then exercise grace and intercede so that the people will see because they can't see right. I don't know how to... Oh, God, that's, God, that's got to make that a revelation in people's hearts. They need your prayer. They need it because they can't see. And so somebody needs to pray the prayer they should be praying on their behalf as if they were them. See, we're, not, we're so unused to that concept, it sounds weird to us. But that's how the Bible describes intercession, the intercessor. When he returns, will he find faith in the earth? True faith that exercises intercessory mercy so that people's eyes can become open so that they can make the decision because God will not make it for them. Because if he does, the first time he does, the entire principle of love is destroyed and becomes evil. Once God exercises control, we're screwed. Because the world will now be filled with the principle of evil. Because it'll kill love. Because love demands absolute, total free will on the part of the person who is being loved. How many in here today want to become an intercessor and who will begin exercising intercession for those who can't see? And you won't judge them for not being able to see because that's like judging a blind man for not being able to see. Well, that's stupid. They can't see, they can't hear. And you judge them for that? How, what, how, how many of you would have gone and said, Helen Keller, those, those who knew who she was, she was a deaf mute and couldn't see, blind, deaf, mute. How many of you would have said, you know, Gary, I'd pray for her, you know, but she's so stupid. Yeah, she's just so stupid. Why, why? I don't know, I don't understand. Nobody would do that. they go, are you kidding me? She's blind, she is deaf, she can't hear, she can't see. Well, we do that all of the time with people that aren't responding the way that we think they ought to be responding. And they will begin to respond if you will begin to intercede. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Hallelujah. That is within me. Bless his holy name. For he has done great things. He has done great things. He has done great things. Bless his holy name. Now, this is going to take 60 seconds, I promise you. It's the final scripture. It describes the kingdom of God. You need to understand this in this process of intercession and life in general. Matthew 13 says the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. We must be given eyes to see the tiny changes because the kingdom of God starts with real little teeny pieces of positive advancement. And we must be able and recognizing and praying, God, give me eyes to see the mustard seeds of the kingdom of God that I am interceding for. Too much of the time we get caught in the thing of if it's not already fully blown, well, then the kingdom of God is not being manifest. But Lorraine's testimony last week, she began to intercede for this office worker. And... 
a lady who had never talked to her about anything positive, out of the blue, for no apparent reason on the surface, came up to her and began to carry on a normal, non-work-related conversation. That was a manifestation of a mustard seed, which was fully the kingdom of God, because a mustard seed is a full, it has, it's complete. It's all there, complete, but very, very, very tiny. So begin to see and bless all of the teensy, tiny pieces of improvement and keep watering them rather than taking away from them by thinking that, well, you know, there needs to be more. Before the kingdom of God really is manifest, there needs to be more. That little teensy, tiny thing was a full manifestation in mustard seed form of the kingdom of God. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you.